Assalamu alaikum wa sallam wa khair. Good evening. Uh, my name is Abraham Swayh. I'm a neurosurgeon, and we are transmitting live from here from Farah Medical Campus in Amman, Jordan. And the backdrop is another unique view from Petra, one of the world's seven wonders. Uh, the topic for tonight is the middle cerebral artery aneurysm, the clinical radiological operative and pathological correlation. So let's look at the middle cerebral artery. The cerebral starts here at the bifurcation of the carotid artery into anterior cerebral and middle cerebral. So this is middle cerebral on this side, which is the right side, middle cerebral on the other side. And here it is inside the uh, sylvian fissure. So the carotid will divide into anterior cerebral A1 and middle cerebral. Again, for you to notice. So if we take just this side, the right side, so it starts from here, at the bifurcation of the antenna carotid, and it goes through the cerebral fissure. And here, at the cerebral point, it starts to divide into two or three bifurcation or trifurcation. So, optic nerve, the right optic nerve, on the left we are looking for <coughs> above, meeting to form optic chiasm. This is the posterior clinoid process. This is the carotid artery coming from the roof of the cavernous sinus, dividing into anterior cerebral, A1, and middle cerebral within the cerebral fissure. This is a frontal lobe, this is temporal lobe. And what we see here is the oculomotor nerve and the oculomotor triangle going to the roof of the uh, cavernous sinus. Close up view, carotid artery, this is optic nerve. This is what you see in teriornal approach, front to temporal approach. So carotid divides into anterior cerebral and middle cerebral. And middle cerebral is coming towards us in the cerebral fissure. This is a very unique view from Yazer Gil book. I looked at it when I was a resident. I still look at it with admiration. It's a beautiful. Uh, it's his handwriting. Mr. Yazerjil, Muhammad Ghazi Yazerjil, is a Turkish neurosurgeon who attained uh, fame internationally. He is the best neurosurgeon in the world. He is a neurosurgeon of the last century. He is 85 now. So this is the carotid dividing into anterior cerebral. Another carotid dividing into middle cerebral and anterior cerebral. The two anterior cerebral meet here, anterior communicating A2s. And the branches from the internal carotid, as it comes off the roof of the of the cavernous sinus into the bifurcation, we have the thalamic artery, the posterior communicating artery, the anterior carotid artery, and uh, the um, artery for the tentorium. And here, the middle cerebral is the M1, which gives you branches in the temporal area, and also branches that goes into the striatum. Of course, we have branches to the stratum from the anterior communicating, but also the most important branches are these ones, the straighter branches. And then it divides into bifurcation or trifurcation. So here you are, carotid, divides into <coughs> anterior cerebral, middle cerebral. These are the branches of the carotid. These are the branches, the lateral branches of the middle cerebral. These are the medial straighter branches of the middle cerebral bifurcation, and then they go into divisions. Uh, when I ask the, uh, the candidates in the Jordanian board, uh, they don't know this. They should not pass, actually, because this is one art that they should know by heart. Uh, but the last exam was disastrous. I was asking them, what is the lacrimal gland? And they were pointing here. So a neurosurgeon doesn't know what the lacrimal gland is. So many variations. Not only that, you need to know the normal anatomy, but you need to know the normal, the variations of these branches and where they are. So the normal anatomy and the variations. Here it looks like a trifurcation, but you can see that maybe it is bifurcation, but these two are dividing 
very, very early or like this. So, so many variations. And to be a vascular surgeon or to be an interventional surgeon, this is basic knowledge. So many, many variations. I want to want to dwell on it. They are really massive variations. <coughs> so look at the anatomy again. The carotid. This is the uh, optic nerve right, optic nerve left, the optic chiasm. Carotid dividing into anterior cerebral, middle cerebral, middle cerebral is coming towards us in the cerebral tissue. In front of the and turn the and the second part of the device into bifurcation or trifurcation. So, if we look at it from the lateral aspect, so this is the ear, this is the orbit, and here is the greater ring of sphenoid, here is the frontal lobe and temporal lobe, here is the Sylvian fissure. So, we open the Sylvian fissure, and here you are, the middle cerebral is coming to us, towards us, and it's rising into an upper branch which is called frontal branch and the lower branch which we call the lower branch so upper frontal lower temporal and then when they go over the insula we call them m2s and when they leave the insula and they climb the cortex they are called m3 and on top they are m4s so here you are m3 m2 m4 the same picture again and this is what you see on angiogram, the cultural artery, the cavernous part, the intracranial part, anterior cerebral, M1, M2, M3, and M4. And it supplies, the middle cerebral artery uh, supplies certain area of the cortex, but here is the bifurcation, and the frontal branch and the temporal branches are equal, so it's called bifurcation equal trunks. Here, the frontal branches, the upper branches are superior, these are minor, these are major, or the opposite. Or you can get the trifurcation, one, two, and the three. Supplies this area of the cortex, if you look at it from the lateral side, or if you look at it from the severe side or from the inferior side. So middle cerebral takes all this area, anterior cerebral takes this area, posterior cerebral takes this area. So we know now what is the middle meningeal artery. What is the aneurysm? What is aneurysm? Aneurysm is a localized dilatation in the wall of the artery, and most of the time it is at the bifurcation. Why at the bifurcation? Because it's a weak spot. A good artery is dividing into two, there got to be some weak spot, that's why the aneurysm arises there. Type of aneurysms are the circular ones, the diffuse ones, or the dissecting ones. If the blood is coming this way, it will flow into the aneurysm and then goes this way. Look at the wall of the artery, it's thick here, it's thin, so this is the area where it ruptures. And when they rupture, they will cause subarachnoid hemorrhage. Let me show you what does that mean. I want you to imagine, of course this happened with me in one of my cases, rupture of aneurysm during surgery. But I just want you to imagine that this is an aneurysm that ruptures in the head of a patient. You cannot put your finger, you cannot put gauze, you cannot put a patty, you cannot put an abdominal pad. You can do nothing except to close that aneurysm. This is optic nerve, and this is the carotid, and this is the aneurysm that has ruptured. So the only thing to do is to clip it with this technique. So when you have subarachnoid hemorrhage, hemorrhage in the subarachnoid space, severe headache. What do usually patients say? Ajani sudan. ما مريش في حياتي شكيت منه صداع زي كأنه واحد خبطني بإشي على رأسي أو كأنه إشي وقع على رأسي كبير على غفلة صدم سفير never been felt before it's a bang it's an explosion associative nausea and vomiting stiffness of the neck blurred or double vision if one of the neck cranial nerves are affected photophobia 
and even uh, sensitivity to the noise or in neurological deficits. Mind you that if 100 patients develop subarachnoid hemorrhage, 50 will die on the spot. They will die wherever they are, driving and sleeping, whatever. And only 50% of them would reach to the hospital. And out of this 50, only half of them would survive. So this is a bad disease. Treatment is either surgical clipping, as you have seen, or interventional therapy. So this is the surgical clipping. It's put this clip on the neck of the aneurysm so that the blood will not go to the uh, aneurysm and it will not rupture. Or you can treat it otherwise. These are the kinds of clips. There are temporary clips, permanent clips, uh, different sizes, shapes, angles. Uh, again, this is from Yezer Jir book. Beautiful thing. All the aneurysms are put in one diag diagram. This is circular bullis, carotid artery, middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery, posterior communicating, basilar artery, posterior cerebral, severe cerebral, basilar, vertebral, ica, ica, etc. So these are the summation of aneurysms. The commonest of these aneurysms are in the anterior circular bullis. So this here is the commonest. Here, backwards, posterior are less common. Middle cerebral represent 33% of the anterior circular bullis. And the commonest part where we have the aneurysm is at the bifurcation. Again, simple question you ask on the, on the board, what is the commonest aneurysm? And the candidate would not know even the middle cerebral artery where it is. They cannot pinpoint where the middle cerebral artery. They just know shunt and disc, and that's it. The aneurysm could be pointing superior, could be pointing medial, pointing lateral, posterior, inferior. It could be complicated like this. When you clip it or do intervention radiology, you don't want to clip these branches. You want to preserve them. So this is the difficulty in treating aneurysms. It's a microscopic surgery. can never be done with the naked eye. Uh, this is what you face. It is a nightmare. No one knows the fear that gets into your heart until you face an aneurysm. It's either you or him. And you can see the fundus is very thin and it's pointing to you. I'm going to rupture, I'm going to rupture. And you say, what brought me here? And this is the clip that you put on the aneurysm. Uh, when I speak about vascular, I have to speak about my bosses who taught me the vascular surgery, and they taught me how to clip an aneurysm. Mr. Alan Richardson, David Utley, Lawrence Walsh, Sheen Olera, they, they actually put the love of vascular surgery in me in the 80s. Also, uh, Lindsay Simon, who also I'm very in debt for him for, for teaching me. This is us in Korea, this is my wife. Uh, Albert Rotten, who taught us a new anatomy, he taught the whole world in new anatomy. Uh, he's like a father figure for me. Uh, Mr. Ghazi Azarjil, still alive, still functioning. Robert Spitzler, one of the most famous vascular surgeons in the world. He was a student of Charles Drake in Canada. Here we are in, 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 in Austria, here they are in my house here in my house, sipping coffee. Uh, he's a great man. Here we are together in the European society, here in Oman, and so on. So when you intermingle with these people, you learn from them. Because whatever you do, at lunch or dinner, you don't speak about sports, you speak about aneurysms or many challenges. So that's why we are dull people. Uh, Spitzler and the others came and met with His Majesty King Abdullah. Vin Cordolins from uh, Slovenia, uh, again is a famous man in the Caverna Sinus and he is a great friend of mine and my family and he helped us in establishing the cadaveric lab in Jordan. And here we are in the Hammam in Turkey, in Hammam Tahit and Matam Hashim. Osama Al-Mufti, Syrian-American uh, chap, he is famous for skull base surgery, again a great man. Uh, Jeha Arnesemi from uh, Finland, very famous man. He has done 5,000 aneurysm clipping. 
Uh, Eduardo de Oliveira from Brazil, again a famous vascular surgeon. Atos de Souza from Brazil, a great man. Here we were lecturing everywhere from Vietnam to Kampuchea to China, everywhere. Hirohito Sano from Japan, and this is a student, uh, Yoko Kato, who took the flag from him. Liliam Shaker, again from India, and the Scarbis Society. <coughs> and the group of Arab vascular neurosurgeons whom I'm proud of, proud to be a friend with them, proud to say their names. Uh, Jafar Jafar from Iraq, Ali Krish from Lebanon, Jack Morcos from Lebanon, Fadi Sharbal from Lebanon. This is Ali Krish, and this is Jafar Jafar, and this is Jack Morcos. Famous international good vascular neurosurgeons. And Ali Krish also helped us in the cadaveric uh, dissections that we had. So, there are two ways of doing things, either clipping it by surgery or by interventional radiology, and for this, I would ask Dr. Farid al to elaborate on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brahim. It's um, a privilege to be here and uh, to be with you today. Uh, I'll try to make this uh, quick and um, easy, although the topic is wide, and I actually will try to stick to the time as much as we can because uh, uh, it is a wide topic. Um, so uh, I'll cover uh, uh, multiple things. Dr. Brahim did uh, cover a few of them, so we'll go over them quickly. But as he mentioned previously, everything starts with the history. And I have to start by this um, famous uh, surgeon, a uh, neurosurgeon, Walter Dandy. He is the first uh, neurosurgeon, and probably Dr. Brahim can comment on that, who actually um, uh, clipped an aneurysm, and that was in 1937. It was a while ago, microscope wasn't there, but it was an innovation of treatment. Um, before that, the first cerebral angiogram was done in, in uh, Lisbon, Portugal in 1927. He was actually a, a, a neurologist and did that first time, and he did get a Nobel Prize, but not for that. He also worked, uh, Igis Monet worked on uh, theory of uh, frontal lobectomy, and that's what he got his uh, Nobel Prize for, but he is credited with the first cerebral. However, moving forward to the current area, the first time when we started thinking about coils and detachable coils, uh, this Italian uh, physician, um, Dr. Cogolimi, uh, actually moved from University of Rome to uh, USLA, uh, University of California at Los Angeles, and worked with a, um, uh, one of the companies to create the first detachable coil, and that was used the first time in uh, human being in 1991. Uh, and in 1995 was the first time this was actually got approval from the FDA. So history-wise, it's not that long. 1995 when was we had the first approval for it. These uh, are uh, some of the giants of neurointerventional um, uh, radiology surgery. Uh, Dr. Pernstein to Brugge, Pernstein in New York. Uh, Dr. Brugge is in Canada. Uh, Dr. Byrne is in uh, England. And Dr. Junius, who passed away in uh, um, 2008, was one of the pioneers in, in neuroanatomy as well. Um, moving quickly, talking about what aneurysm, Dr. Brahim spoke uh, a little bit about this. Essentially, most aneurysm, are these outpouchings, form at arterial bifurcations. And the reason why they form there, the anatomy uh, of the vessels there is a little bit different. They are poorly muscular layers and much um, uh, more collagen and less elastic tissues. So they are more commonly forming there. Uh, essentially, the wall of the aneurysm, the reason why it ruptured, it lacks essential uh, internal elastic lamina at that area. It's a very weak area. What's left there is a little bit of entima and adventitia, and that's what, what Dr. Brahim mentioning, how it's uh, very thin. Uh, why it happens, uh, there is Definitely not a, a, a solid theory, but we know it's not congenital. Most of them are not born well. Um, however, we know that hemodynamics and uh, acquired degenerative changes, in addition to inflammation as a combination, cause these aneurysms. Uh, when you talk about hemodynamics, in the last uh, 15, 20 years, we've been able to st slowly study the actual flow in the aneurysm going into it and coming out of it. And that actually, uh, 
proves in a lot of ways how the directional flow is associated with the enlarging of the aneurysm and as well as thinning of the wall and formation of the aneurysm. In addition to that, uh, there is much more evidence now. Inflammation in the wall of the arteries has a key role uh, in forming this aneurysm as well as rupturing of the aneurysm. Now we have already studies um, in the end process to show that anti-inflammatories such as aspirin, now the most commonly used, is actually in some way preventive to rupture the aneurysm. It will prevent or decrease the risk of rupture. And when we studied the, uh, the studies of the wall of the aneurysm, there is clear intense inflammatory reaction. And that has been proven actually by vessel wall imaging. Now we're able to image the wall of the aneurysm by MRI and we look at the level of enhancement, which reflects the amount of inflammation in the wall. And that's one of the predictors of aneurysm prone to rupture compared to ones that doesn't have as much inflammation. That helps us a lot if somebody come with ruptured aneurysm and he has two aneurysm, which one actually ruptured? Sometimes it's not very easy to decide. It depends on anatomy and stuff. But this is a very important clue to where to go from here. Um, there are other factors that plays into the equation. I wanted to mention the familial component. It's a very small percentage of it, but it's important to remember if there are a family with two members who developed an aneurysm, there's a 17% chance of another family having an aneurysm, and this family should be screened. So not everyone with an aneurysm, the entire family we screen, but if two members, the chances goes up dramatically. Obviously, smoking has been established as one of the definite causes that increase the chance of causing aneurysms and, more importantly, rupture, and more importantly, recurrence after we treat them. One of the things that can happen when we treat aneurysms, they come back either by uh, coiling or less likely by uh, clipping. However, smoking increases that chance. Heavy alcohol consumption and, obviously, um, cocaine use. So prevalence, how often? It's actually much more often than you think. We probably are 50 in this room, and there is a very good chance one of us has a brain aneurysm. So one in 50 in the population has a brain aneurysm. Luckily, minority of these goes on to rupture, and that's the biggest challenge. But um, the, the a number of aneurysms are much more than actually the ones that we see. Um, they are, when they rupture, if you see a patient with an aneurysm, there is a 20% chance he has another one. So that's what very important to remember, and actually smaller percentage have two or three. Luckily, or, uh, they are a little bit more common in females. So um, coming to what age do we expect them? Typically in the adulthood. Actually, this is, it's the most productive age, fourth to sixth uh, decade. That's actually when the people are most productive. However, it's un unfortunately, um, when it hits. However, there is a subset of this aneurysm that comes in pediatric patients. And we have to remember that these are a little bit different in different categories, but in a different way. They are more common in males. They are typically large. They uh, come with mass effect, but they definitely exist in children. Size, we categorize them according to small, large, and giant based on the size. The, the small, less than 10 millimeter, large and giant, 10 to 25, more than 25. The reason why this is important, it affects treatment. It affects the risk of things, of rupture. It affects how we treat them and the risk of recurrence after we treat them. Giant aneurysms are a small percentage of aneurysm. Two and a half centimeter and above is a giant aneurysm. But somebody with a giant aneurysm, not only it ruptures more often, it actually causes the patient more often comes with progressive mass effect symptoms. They compress on nerves, structures, and they come with that, or they come with strokes because uh, thrombus form in the aneurysm migrates into other arteries and cause uh, stroke. It's very important when you hear an aneurysm to know where it is. If somebody say he has a cavernous aneurysm, that's very important to know that the likelihood of this causing a cavernous IC aneurysm, the likelihood of causing a subarachnoid hemorrhage is almost zero. The reason, it's extradural, outside the dura, which is very important for us when we're talking about where is the location of the aneurysm. The margin is usually the ophthalmic artery. Anything beyond, below the ophthalmic artery, the chances of causing subarachnoid hemorrhage is very low. That's why we don't treat them unless they are causing mass uh, effect, a large giant aneurysms. They, um, 90% of these aneurysms, as Dr. Brahim said, are in the anterior circulation, coming from carotid or bifurcation of carotids. They are much smaller, uh, much less in number in the posterior circulation in the basilar, 
uh, the ACOM is the most common in the front, uh, coming with the PCOM and then MCA. Shape, they come in different shapes, but in general, either you have the, the sacular, a bowl, or a fusiform dilatation of the artery. However, there are a lot of different shapes. These are the come, but if you think of dissecting aneurysm, they come in so many different shapes. Essentially, you have a tear in the media where the blood forms there and start expanding. In acute phase, it causes subarachnoid hemorrhage. In chronic phase, enlargement start pushing on nerves and causing pressure symptoms. There's also the uh, atherosclerotic aneurysms where the entire artery will start dilate, most commonly in the basilar. These are disaster at the aneurysm. There is not e easy treatment for them. They involve the entire artery, and um, a patient often comes with actually uh, uh, pontine or perforator strokes because of the uh, thrombus that form along the wall of the aneurysm. These are very difficult aneurysms to treat with very high mortality. Um, blister aneurysm, a tiny, a, a tiny plip that forms on the wall of the carotid. I don't, I don't know if you are able to see this tiny with the, with the arrow, but this is very easy to miss and very difficult to treat. It's a nightmare for the surgeons before uh, the interventional techniques and still a very hard thing to fix even with the interventional techniques. Before the flow diverters, you cannot put this, a coil in this tiny thing, but these patients come with a real subarachnoid hemorrhage and they will bleed again if you don't treat them. So these are different forms of aneurysm and they come with different shapes and um, formats. Infectious aneurysms, different category, patient with endo, uh, infective endocarditis showing up with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, I'm glad Dr. Montasser uh, is with us here. I'm sure he has seen uh, some of these. Um, they are typically very distal, not, have nothing to do with the frequencies we talked about. They are very distal and very small arteries. Okay. As, as your cases? This one, no, this one is not. Mm -hmm. So this is actually very rare. I haven't seen one of these actually in, in, in uh, practice uh, yet, and I hope I don't, but uh, yes, yes. So um, this one is actually uh, a patient uh, that was having an endocarditis untreated uh, accordingly. Traumatic aneurysm happening in kids, and uh, most often minor trauma or major trauma, and result in uh, typically uh, a specific sites of injury at certain areas where it's close to the dentorium or the falx. So you have uh, this uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage will come not necessarily immediately, may has happen weeks or months after. Um, when you are thinking about brain aneurysms, you have it into, uh, automatically to think, are we talking about ruptured or unruptured brain aneurysms? In my mind, they are completely different diseases to some degree. Anatomically, if you look at it, it's the same, but the way we look at it, the way we treat it, the way we think about it is completely different. Ruptured brain aneurysm need to be treated immediately, urgently, uh, and large percentage of these ruptured ones are very small. <laughs> On the other hand, if you have an unruptured aneurysm, there's a lot of debate when and how to treat it. Um, SOA study, the international study for unruptured intracranial aneurysm, has to do uh, studied that. We'll talk briefly about it but there is a lot of debate about it. We use a lot of things to think, should we treat it or not, based on a lot of factors. We'll talk about it briefly. To talk about the evidence, why endovascular techniques has took a long role and now actually the majority of aneurysm being treated that way. This gentleman directed the first uh, study that proved the benefit of it. Uh, Dr. Mullins uh, have, uh, uh, was the director of the International Subarachnoid Aneurysm Trial, the ISAT trial. This trial was published in 2002. This was the first randomized trial actually to prove that um, the benefit of uh, endovascular therapy and superiority to clipping in that situation. The one thing I will mention here, if you look, this is a busy slide, but the way this was done, which is very important to understand, an aneurysm comes in, patient with aneurysm rupture, a neurosurgeon, a neurointerventionist will sit together and decide, is this is an aneurysm that both of us can treat safely to some degree? So every patient, the answer has to be yes to be in the study, because if this neurosurgeon said this is too difficult for us to treat, a basilar tip, this is a difficult to treat aneurysm by clipping, it will not be in the study. So it has to be able to treat it by surgery or endovascular technique. Both of them agree, then they will include it. That's why if you look at the earlier number, from 9,500 ruptured aneurysm, 7,000 was excluded, because either the endovascular specialist said, I cannot treat this, 
or the surgeon said, I cannot treat this. So this is very important to be, most of these patients were low grade. These are different grades of arachnoid hemorrhages. So they are relatively not in coma because most neurosurgeons will avoid, and Dr. Prahim can comment on that, avoid clipping patients who are in a bad shape uh, because of the effect on them. Uh, most of them were anterior circulation because posterior circulation is typically much harder to clip uh, than to coil. The results, in 2002, the results showed that there is a 22% um, absolute benefit of endovascular treatment over clipping uh, when we convert the two technique. So that by itself cemented uh, endovascular technique as superior to clipping and, 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 and these ruptured aneurysms based on the way we said, and we describe it. However, we followed these patients. This is 2005 now. There continued to be benefit of endovascular therapy over clipping, less mortality. This is accumulative mortality over seven years. The red line is the um, uh, clipping. Blue line is coiling, and you could see that endovascular has less mortality, despite there is a slightly higher risk of rebleed after coiling. So, despite that, and when we calculated the risk of slight increase of coiling, uh, the still the mortality over the long term was higher with clipping. So that's why things moved forward. This was proven in 2009, almost 10 years after finishing uh, the 2009 data showed similar things. Uh, this is uh, a very uh, uh, a study, uh, the Barrow uh, Ruptured Aneurysm Trial. Um, Dr. Spitzler is, as uh, Dr. Ibrahim uh, uh, mentioned, very famous neurosurgeon, especially vascular skull-based surgeon. Uh, essentially, well, this was done in a way to prove the contrary, uh, to prove the contrary that endovascular therapy is, is better. However, uh, they, they randomized the patients, and eventually their data showed 15.5% absolute uh, difference in favor of endovascular therapy in their data. However, the conclusion said multicentral needed. Obviously, that was not surprises, but coming from Barrow, which is a big neuroscience center, was a very important thing. To not um, uh, go uh, too much into this, is radiologically the only thing that you do is calling the No, we'll go into that. We'll go into that. Mm -hmm. So, unruptured aneurysm, different disease in my mind. These aneurysms could stay the same, so could stay the same, follow them up, nothing changed for years. They could, over uh, years, slightly enlarge and eventually rupture, or suddenly enlarge and rupture. And we're really trying to figure which one is that. Um, the international study of unruptured aneurysm tried to answer that question. Which one should we actually focus on? Which one should we treat? Interestingly, when they did this study, uh, there was group one, group two, group one that had no previous subarachnoid hemorrhage. If you have an aneurysm that's less seven millimeter in size, and it was in the internal carotid artery uh, or in the middle cerebral or anterior communicating artery, the risk of rupture was near zero. Even if you moved uh, to seven to 12, the risk was 0.5 per year. 0.5% per year. So the number were really low. The th so what we learned from them is there are patients who definitely we need to we look at. Patients with posterior, communica posterior communicating artery aneurysm or posterior circulation, basilar aneurysm, very risky. PCOM aneurysm, very risky. So we looked at these factors. We des uh, they described if it's a basilar aneurysm, posterior communicating artery aneurysm, or ACOM, we really need to think about it. If it's more than seven millimeter or daughter sac, basically uh, an aneurysm on top of the aneurysm, what we call it, it's a, it's a contained rupture almost. So a lot of factors, so there is, um, this is what a lot of us use, a score system to try to decide, should I treat this patient aneurysm or not, based on multiple factors. Not necessarily you have an aneurysm need to be treated. So that's very important to remember because of the risks of treatment is not zero, it's never zero. This is a very important thing of us we, when we try to treat, uh, we think about which is what's the neck of the aneurysm, that space between uh, the parent artery from here to here, the space, uh, that's what we call the neck, and the dome, how, how high it is. This is very important because traditionally when we put coils, that was need to be a small neck to hold the coils in place uh, so they don't come out. Things change. There is so many different ways to treat an aneurysm. Uh, traditional way of putting coils, 
uh, putting coils and putting a stent through it or using a balloon while we're doing it uh, to, to hold the coils inside, like here, essentially a catheter goes into the aneurysm, we coils and then put a, a balloon to prevent it uh, from coming out. Um, we'll go over cases to show that. Uh, these are uh, patients we treated um, personally. These, this is a patient with a PCOM aneurysm. This is the internal carotid artery. This is the posterior communicating artery aneurysm here. Obviously, you see the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Again, you see the aneurysm right here. This is actually the microcatheter going from the groin all the way up to the aneurysm. We are inside the aneurysm. We look at the aneurysm from inside rather than from outside. What you see here is first the microcatheter. This is the small wire that helps us to reach there. And once we reach there, we start deploying these coils. This is the traditional standard coiling. We keep doing it until we fill the aneurysm completely and no more blood going there. In a way, we don't obstruct other arteries. So in the end of that procedure, I have to see uh, I have to see that no more blood going there. Here, there is the, this is the posterior communicating, uh, supplying uh, fetal origin to the posterior cerebral artery, so we have to keep it open. So that part of the very proximal part of the neck, we didn't coil. The reason is if I coil it, I'll obstruct that artery. So that's an, an uncompletely uh, occluded neck of the aneurysm because of the origin of the artery next bite. So that's what we sometimes have to deal with. This is a balloon example of how we use balloon. This is a big, this is a ruptured ACOM aneurysm, anterior communicating artery aneurysm. As you could see here, this big outpouching right there. And this is a wide neck. If we talk to remember to talk a wide, a wide neck, this is, if I just put a coil there, it may not sit there without obstructing the same artery. What you have there, uh, from here to here, these two dots represent a balloon that's sitting against the neck of the aneurysm. Another catheter goes inside the aneurysm. We inflate the balloon across the neck, and we deploy the aneurysm inside the, um, inside the, we deploy the coils inside the aneurysm until we fill it while the balloon is there. The balloon gets inflated and deflated through that time in a way to make sure that these coils will stay stable when, when we remove the balloon at the end. And we do that a lot in ruptured aneurysm because stents are not, uh, for a resident I mentioned, is not the first choice in ruptured aneurysm. And this is a very um, ex excellent technique. I use it most of the time, not only to protect the neck, but to protect the patient in case we have rupture during the procedure. Dr. Uh, Brahim mentioned the case when there was a rupture during procedure. And for us, to, I'm not able to open the brain and control it, but I have a balloon sitting in the artery that if I have rupture, and we could have rupture during coiling, will inflate the balloon, control the situation immediately. Do you uh, have a number how many times you coil? How Every time we, yeah, every time we know how many coils, but based on the size of the aneurysm, you have to keep filling it until no more blood is there. Is there a maximum? Well, no, no. there's no maximum. No. You, the, uh, you shouldn't stop until you feel that you occluded the aneurysm. It's like putting half a clip and, uh, on the aneurysm rather than the other clip. There's a danger every time that you go, at the Roma will go. Uh, it's part of the risk of the procedure. Uh, so with balloon assisted coiling, uh, you, you, uh, help avoid the issues of wide neck aneurysm. These issues were not, uh, at the time when that I sat, there was no balloon uh, uh, part of it. At the, so at the end, you don't have any filling of that aneurysm. Almost coming to the end, um, this is an example of a basilar aneurysm. Basilar artery, big aneurysm. Look at how wide the neck is. Whatever you put there, it will come out of it the minute you remove the balloon. So that's where the revolution came, where we started actually deploying stents designed for the renal vascular structures. Here we have what we call Y technique. Essentially, we deployed these two stents in a Y fashion. Essentially, you have two arms going into posterior cerebral artery and the two stents in the basilar before we even put any coil there. And then we go through these stents and deploy the coil. The, the importance of this preventing coils from coming out and more importantly, we change the flow dynamics across the neck of the aneurysm by the stents. Um, this is after stenting. Essentially, no more contrast, no more blood going there. Finishing with these type of aneurysms, and when you have this kind of aneurysm, there is no coil that sits there. There is no neck, essentially. These are giant aneurysms. For a long time, these were not having endovascular technique. This is a patient with huge basilar aneurysm. 
diffuse um, atherosclerotic aneurysms. Uh, th essentially, there is no endovascular techniques ad, uh, be, that I mentioned that would be adequately treating for these. Before, what were done, that the neurosurgeons will do a bypass for it. It's still, it's being done. Bypass is a major uh, way of treating aneurysms, but it's, it's really a, a, a complex procedure that needs a very high expertise and high volumes. What happens in the most, in, the biggest innovation of endovascular therapy happened with coiling, and nothing happened for almost 20 years until we developed what we call flow diverters. It's a type of what looks like a stent uh, that essentially prevents the blood from going into these large structures. We put it in the aneurysm, in the artery, so the blood goes into the artery and doesn't go into the aneurysm. Um, these are examples. This, what happens when you deploy the stent into the, immediately where we have stagnation of blood into the aneurysm. It's not a covered stent. Blood can go in and out. But essentially, it, it makes, it, it, it changes the flow dynamics into that aneurysm. The other thing it does, it gives a scaffolding that entima will start building over that mesh. Um, this is another examiner. We have a large, big aneurysm. You deploy this, what looks like a stent. In six months, we'll repeat the, um, the imaging. Immediately, it's not protective. Patients can rupture immediately because it's not preventing blood from going there. It needs three to six months to have an effect, sometimes up to a year. And that's why we don't typically use it into the, um, uh, in the rupture mm -hmm. aneurysm. Finishing here, this aneurysm tried to treat the uncoilable, uh, keep side branches open, uh, less, if, uh, uh, less, uh, less uh, coils, and we treat what we couldn't treat before. This trial proved that we can do that and showed that this aneurysm we couldn't treat before, now we have very good chance of treating. And there's no delay uh, in, uh, there is no recurrence. That's the biggest thing with these aneurysms. When we coil, there is almost a 10 to 20 percent of chance of recurrence of the aneurysms. With uh, flow diverters, the chances are very, very low. So that's the major thing we use. However, these patients need anticoagulation uh, uh, during procedure and need a strong antiplatelets for treatment. <coughs> Finishing um, with these two slides. Rupture aneurysms are never easy or never one thing. Every patient is different. This is a patient we faced, and I'm glad Dr. Ibrahim is here. He could see the images. And this is to show how there is no real strong rules. This is a big um, intrabrinchymal hemorrhage from um, an MCA aneurysm. MCA aneurysm can rupture into the brinchymal and give you not only subarachnoid hemorrhage, intrabrinchymal hemorrhage. Small neck, how would you treat that? Should we start by drainage, uh, EVD, the ventric? Should we evacuate the clot? You have an aneurysm. Should we clip the clot immediately? or go and coil. There are two di so many different ways of doing it, and everybody would do it differently based on what? Based on the clinical picture of that patient. So at the end of the day, this is a team approach. And uh, honestly, it's, it's almost incomprehensible to do it as a one-man show, because you cannot. You, it just, it just, you cannot serve the patient in the right way that way. <laughs> in the end of the way, it's true there are so many ways to skin the cat, but you have always to think of your local culture. What's the best expertise in that place, in that hospital, to help that patient? In the end of the day, with every aneurysm, you have to think of the patient clinical uh, status, of the anatomy. The anatomy truly tells you where to go and what kind of expertise you have in that place. That decides which way to go. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. OK. so. We showed what is aneurysm. We talked about some anatomy, and we showed that they can be clipped by this uh, uh, surgical method of clipping, or they can be treated with many interventional ways that Dr. Adam mentioned. Uh, so it was sort of revolutionized at every step. Uh, I'm so interested in this that in Paris, or in other places, there is a meeting every year at the Louvre and I attend that and make it a point to attend. It's interventional and the neurosurgical. So we sit there, we fight, we exchange ideas, and you get more knowledgeable when you go out. Just looking at this, Dr. Adham mentioned this story. 
let me summarize it. In the 80s, when I was having my residency in England, there was nothing called coiling, it was only clipping. And the clippers, the neurosurgeons who clip aneurysm, were the famous, the most respected. And if you are resident in training and you get an aneurysm to clip, then nobody can catch you, you walk in the world, uh, and I'm bad, I'm at aneurysm. I remember being given the first aneurysm in my life, six months into my residency. And the whole world could not take me. I was so glad that I could do an aneurysm. But then came the ISAT study, and then things started to change. You have to accept change. The interventional radiology gives you better results than the surgical results. Although Dr. Adam mentioned that the risk of re-bleeding is more in the, in the coiling rather than in the clipping, but still, all in all, it's a good way of doing things. We are not enemies. We sit together and discuss what is the best for this patient. Can I do it? Can he do it? Or we can't do it? Send him somewhere else. It is back to your honesty and integrity to decide what is the best for this patient. One area is that somebody puts a coin and it ruptures. And then the only way to do is to do clipping of this aneurysm with cords in it. It's so, so, so difficult because you cannot put a clip. It's hard with these cords. So there is a new era of surgical treatment of coiled aneurysms. It is, yeah, it is really, it really difficult. So let's speak about this patient that we have prepared for you. What's the material of the coiling? Material of the coiling. Most of the time it's platinum. But uh, it changed from, uh, the one thing that happened dramatically between before and now, most of the clips before were some form of uh, uh, metal that would prevent patients from having an MRI. Now things change. For us, it's always an MRI safe, and I'm mentioning that for every radiologist. So platinum is the most, is the largest component of that metal inside it. So, so the clips and cords are now MRI compatible. So this is a 51-year-old male Jordanian who lives and works in uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, he complained of sudden headache that was followed by loss of consciousness for 30 minutes back in Saudi Arabia. When he woke up there, he was confused and he had uh, seizures and he had double vision. And his past history, he had hyperlipidemia on Lipitor. And interesting enough, two years before that, he was diagnosed to have a stroke on the left side. This was actually not a stroke. Kilmet stroke in the Arab country is an ugly word. Kulshi stroke. And they are not actually looked at carefully. This man had subarachnoid hemorrhage at that time. And he was diagnosed as a stroke. A stroke is a very peculiar word. A heavy smoker. So all the criteria, heavy smoker, hyperlipidemia, and no alcohol ingestion. Um, as Dr. Adam mentioned, it is more in females, lucky for us. Uh, and in females, when they have their subarachnoid hemorrhage, most of them, they are on the contraceptive pills. And this is very interesting. In males, when they have subarachnoid hemorrhage, 25% of them had subarachnoid hemorrhage during sexual intercourse, which shows you how dangerous that is. Or shitting, actually. <laughs> or straining, yes. Vital signs. Vital signs. He had hypertension. Uh, he had basal crepitations. He was agitated and confused. He had right signal palsy. In fact, he came to Jordan uh, without being diagnosed as subarachnoid hemorrhage. He was diagnosed as a stroke. Sarah the stroke the man, had a stroke. Rick of Tayara, or Mishi, or Wassel, a stretcher room. He arrived to Jordan about two weeks after his subarachnoid hemorrhage. We love to operate on them as early as possible, but he came two weeks later. Uh, no weakness in his limbs, bleeding, kidney functions, liver functions. Okay, and this is his CT scan. What do you see? The blood in the interhemispheric fissure, blood in the cerebral fissure on the left, but more blood on the right side. So we learned, and there is blood in the, in the basal systems. We learned to diagnose the cause of hemorrhage by just looking at the CT scan. I would never call this hypertensive bleed. 
I would never say that this is an AVM rupture. I would never say this is due to a coagulation process a problem. This is a middle cerebral artery aneurysm rupture. So we could tell from the CT what's going on. Also blood in the old the basal cystic, but more in the cerebrum fissure right. So 99% this is a middle cerebral artery aneurysm. Angiogram, indeed, this is the carotid, the cavernous part, the intracranial part, anterior cerebral, acum, A2s, middle cerebral, and bifurcation. There is many lobed aneurysm at the bifurcation of the middle cerebral. And you can see it's pointing downwards and lateral and anterior. So not only you diagnose aneurysm, but you have to imagine the aneurysm, how many lobes, where it is directed, where is the fundus. Because the area of, of, of danger is the fundus. As I mentioned before, if hundreds of us are sitting here in this hole and the hundreds of us develop subarachnoid hemorrhage, 50 will die here in this hole. The other 50 will go to the hospital, 25 will die later. Only 25% of patients will survive. Can you tell which one ruptured? This one. It is the same aneurysm. It is the same aneurysm, but as answering your question, if I have multiple aneurysms, say I have one here, one there, and one here, which one has rupture? I see where is the blood, what is the direction of the blood, and it is said the more lobed it is, the more it, that it has ruptured, and the more it is proximal, the more it has ruptured. So you can tell. So what it is. So this is danger. How come he stayed alive, this one? What was his... Just like pure love. God's wish. And it becomes a or easy, cabin pressure, the whole thing. Uh, most of the subarachnoid hemorrhages that I have treated in Jordan, they came walking into my clinic. Assassin, they have headache. Shows you how backwards we are in terms of diagnosis and that we are proud of the progress of the medicine in Jordan. We should be also shamed, shamed by the uh, not diagnosing these things. Chest X-ray ECG were normal. We did a few consultations. Uh, actually, this was 2001 or two, and uh, the patient came to Jordan Hospital, and Dr. Maui Arabna was there, so I asked him to see the patient. Of course, I sat with the family, there is something called interventional radiology. I said with the family, what do you want? We have interventional radiology and we have surgery. Most of the time, people would choose interventional. Those people said, no way, we want surgery. We want this to be clipped and want to fly back to Saudi Arabia. So, Maui. Thank you very much, Dr. Ibrahim. As always, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. It's a pleasure working uh, uh, with you. Uh, I've been in this business for, for long enough in anesthesia, just about to finish my career in, in anesthesia in a few years' time, inshallah. Uh, a few things, no matter how many, how many years I've been in anesthesia, I feel every time is first time, hand on my heart, and this is an exam for me, am I going to take this exam or, or fail this exam? Subarachnoid hemorrhage, clipping, uh, cabbage ma valve, that no 50-50 chance in the Rahman bin Idaya, cervical epidural. These are three things I wish every time. I never see them again. Every time I do them, sarah <laughs> yani. No, every time is first time. No matter how you do them, and this is this is uh, one of them. Unfortunately, he, he said, I've anesthetized uh, many of them in England harvesting subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's heartbreaking. No, as Dr. Farid mentioned, هذول بكونوا peak of their age, peak of their العطاء تبعهم. Healthy, wealthy, all of the sudden, but then they are organ donors. All of the sudden, you have to give, convince the family organ donors, you spend all night on it. So, it is very bad. It, uh, I, I wish I didn't even talk about the, the, this issue, because it, it's very heartbroken. Uh, ju just a few words, a few sarfi overlapping. It's most, uh, although most uh, cerebral are asymptomatic, discovered incidentally most of the time. لأن دكتور فريد منشي كمان إنه كل كل خمسين فيهم واحد بس when it's rupture results in significant morbidity mortality unfortunately and we make become إحنا as an anesthesiologist we become involved in clipping 
الكويلنج الرابتشر اور ات ات ان ستيج اوف سبراكنويد هومرج اجين سيم ثينج الستاتستكس تبع تبع الدكتور ابراهيم شوي مختلف لانه بروبلم بتاعته من وين تيجي تو ثيرز جيت تو ذا هوسبيتال اف يو ار ليفينج ان بيتر بلايس اذا كنت في عمان وازمه زي امبارح فورجت ات 0% توصل للمستشفى 0% اي كان جارانتي صدقني اذا كنت بتعيش في في مدينه متحضره وهذا توصل في 70% تشانس سو ات ديبيندز وير ذا ثيرد اوف ذا من هوسبيتال سيفير ديسابلد اور حتى اللي بوصلوا يعني بموتوا بالمستشفى ات از ارجنت اوبريشن اند نوت ايمرجنت كيس وهذا فور ماي كوليج مديوكر كوليجز اللي يجوا بشخصوا بالاشعه بتصل فيك بقلب الدنيا بطلع مش عارف ايش والمريض بكون هذا طبعا ريسبي تو كل ذا بيشنت له انت بتكون اوريدي هاند يور هاند ان هارت ام اي جوين تو باس ذس وهو بحط عليك بريشر بتصل فيك من الاشعه تجهز لي اياها طلع لي بدون ما تشوف نوت بريبير بتاخذه مشان تقعد عليه فوق ات از ارجنت بس نيفر از ان ايمرجنت عبال ما انت انه تو 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 سورت ام اوت نيفر از ايرجنت فور اس Our goals to prevent aneurysm rupture. بصراحة الجولز اللي بدي أحكي لك إياه ما ترفع ضغطه، ما تنزل ضغطه، ما تعطيه فلويد، وأعطيه فلويد. ما تعمل له هايبر فنتيليشن وأعمل له هايبر فنتيليشن. I don't know how, but, but you have to do it. I don't know how, but these are the goals. كل اللي بحكي لك إياه عن جد ارفع ضغطه بس نزل ضغطه. أعطيه فلويد وما تعطيه فلويد. بس these are the goals. يعني you have to play. Uh, because you have to avoid changes in blood pressure. Sudden changes in blood pressure, خاصة على الإندكشن. يعطي العافية هو راح يفوت ومش عارف بس already أنت you finished the patient وهذا وسلمته مريض already rupture ومنتهي وهو راح يفوت ويشتغل إذا إنه صار في عندك changes swinging على على البداية. Decrease intracranial pressure again with your intubation with your with your هذا. Uh, Maintain cerebral perfusion pressure at all times if you can more seventy more than seventy millimeter mercury if you can because. نتكلم هلا برجع لها بعدين ام بريفنت سيربل اسكيميا لانه هيز جوين تو بوت تو ان ريتراكشن زي ما شفتوا هذا عبين ما يوصل له اتس ديب اند جود اوبريتنج كونديشن اف يو دونت فاسيليتيت هيز ورك هي ويل نيفر ريتش ذا انيوريزم سو نو موفمنت بدك فيري ويل ريلاكس برين سوفت ريلاكس اند هي وونت تو اكسبوز ذيس ذيس ار اور جولز طبعا وي جوت ارمادا اوف دراكس تو هيلب يو نيتروجليسرين ازمولول شورت اكتنج فيزبروسر ريلي كله افيلبل موجودين عندك ريمي فنتنين ناو ديز و موست سام تايمز خاصه اذا كانوا له سيفرال ديز اذا كان المريض موجود على نيمودبين ويل ميك يور لايف ماتش ماتش مور ديفيكالت واحنا شفنا مرضى من هذول لانه هي ويل تند تو بي هيلب تنسف اول ذا تايم وانت بدك ترفع موست اوف ذا تايم تو كيب سي بي بي في هذا الميديكيشن ويجي اخوان الفيزيشن وحطوا لي This is make our life even more miserable. Usually, preoperatively, they are either symptomatic or asymptomatic. It depends. If you have a It depends on subarachnoid hemorrhage grade. And if there is any myocardial effects, and the tendency, they will have some myocardial effects. Please look for it. They are possibly intubated. Location size of an aneurysm, where is it? Intracranial mass effect, and neurological deficit and symptoms, and timing. لأنه timing مهم إنه نعرف إمتى صار هذا الرابتشر لأنه the time هلا برجع له إذا صار recent لأنه maybe there is a good time for us to escape from this spasm. وإذا كان إله several days بتفرق كتير ما راح أطول عليه this the the several kinds of classification from a grade one to four مشان نشوف إنه grade one the ASA best one grade four is the gravest one. Preoperative, not much really. One IV, because they bleed, they bleed like hell. Ilo much, but not torrential bleed. اللي إنه بحتاج لهذا يعني. You need only one IV. You need if he's anxious, لأنه شباب وزي ما حكيت well off. Probably it's good if you want to premedicate him, لأنه صراحة مرعب الوضع. And remind of potential post-op intubation. خاصة إنه إذا كان حسب الجريت تبع السبب إنه تمر. Whether he's a grade one, two, uh, hopefully he, he will be extubated. But he, if he's a grade four, he will be intubated. I'll consent for intubation. Then I'm not going to be able to Adequate fluid loading, just the bare minimum, five to six millimeter per kilogram. Induction, I'm not going to be Routine monitors, as I'm going to arterial cannula before intubation, because most important things, most important things, blood pressure. تحكى عن انيوريزم فاني ثين وول عنده سبارك اجى الانيوريزم وهذا وي دونت وونت تو رابتشر ترايت ات ذا بيجنينج وهو احنا مش عارفين انه رابتشر من هذا 
طبعا سموث اندكشن سموث ميتس سموث اكسبشن هذا برجع لك هاو يو جوين تو ران ذا سموث وزي ما حكيت يو جوت ارمادا ناو ديز اوف ميديكيشنز تو دو اول ذيس اند كريتيكال بيريود اللي هي ما في البنز وزي ما بتشوفوا بنعمل مع الدكتور ابراهيم اول ذا تايم انه بستنى عليه يقعد بوت سم لوكلز على اساس ما بد يو دونت ونت ذيس سوينجينج ان بلاد بريشر لانه وان بن لما يحطوا ذا بيشنت از نوت ديب انف هيز بلاد بريشر ويل سيرش فروم 100 تو 300 وانس اميديتلي Skin incision, periosteal flap is extremely painful. Otherwise, bone is not painful except the periosteum. So when you, when you want to start to do uh, elevation of uh, periosteum, it has to be deep. This is the amount to cause increased blood pressure. Hence, narcotics and propofol is advised. Maintenance, moderate hyperventilation. And tidal CO2, 30-something. I don't know what this is. Millimeter mercury. Eovolumic, ringer lactate, 500, as I said, minimum, but you good, you need to. Probably moderate hypothermia is good, 35 degrees centigrade, then you can decrease in oxygen consumption, metabolic rate. So you ice him down? Uh, we don't ice. Uh, the theater is not so bad, it's 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 not so من الاستمراري ايش يعني بالانستيزيا؟ بالانستيزيا والله هذا بيعتمد على ذوقك حكيم يعني كلياتهم زي ما حكى في مورفين في ريمفين في ريمفين في ريمفين وات وات يو ار يوزنج بيست بليز دو يوز ات اللي تحافظ على البارامترز اللي حكيت لك عليها فينتريل يمكن اما اول شيء اما جنرال براكتشنر ما راح ادخل فيهم هلا لانه هذا موضوع حكيم بس اللي انت بايدك احسن شيء بيشتغل بايدك ومتعود عليه عند يو جارانتي You are not going to have swinging blood pressure. Over the next one, please do use it. Kitar. But after that, we can talk about it after the meeting. Doctor, this was already ruptured, correct? Yes. Yes. This patient is already ruptured. This patient is already ruptured. Ah, already ruptured. But does not mean that we can't take it. Just don't want it any further bleeding. Ah, I mean, oh, thank you. Ruptured. Finished. Okay. No, it's not like that. طيب نرجع للانتايدل كربون دايوكسايد وانا بحكي للريزنس اول ذا تايم من سم بوكس وكنت اسال بالبورد زيك انه قديش قديش الرينج سوري قديش الفاليو اوف كربون دايوكسايد بحكوا الرينج من 35 تو 45 ايش مكتوب بالكتب؟ اي سيد ات از نيفر ات از 40 ات از 40 فروم داي زيرو تو يو ار 100 ييرز اولد ات از 40 ات كانت بي لانه يور براين يور ريسبيرت سنتر ويل سنس 0.1 ملم ميركل تشينجز of acid and carbon dioxide. Allah ما راح يعطيك إشي في range 10 millimeter mercury was going to sense it. Otherwise, ما راح يعيش. So it is not regardless whether retro or not, but it is for zero. This is normal carbon dioxide tension in the blood. فش في range at all. Cerebral flow drops three to four percent for every millimeter. لو كان في range يا إخوان. How are we going to drop the cerebral blood flow? Is the range 10 faldi? We are going to. We are going to drop 3 to 4 percent for every millimeter mercury. I want you to remember this. يعني لما يكون وهذا for our our my في عندي كمان مديوكر ان استيجولوجيست. أنا بذكر إنه في واحد دكتور عزيز عليا قبل few months توفى والده. دخل مستشفى في هذا البلد. بده يعمل very simple operation. بس أبوه كان in nineties bladder stone. عملها بعدين طلع ابوه مش ابوه لانه كربون انتاج الكربون طبعا when you are old your carbon dioxide لما يوصل 29 29 ملم مركي you could imagine several the flow قديش بده يقول almost 10% ولما تكون 90 اوريدي في عندك سيركلورز في عندك مشاكل بكون 0% بطلع من العمليات توتال anyway he died after afterwards لانه many complications فلما يكون عندك انتاج الكربون دايوكسيد 30 ملم مركي اللي هو كنا بالزمانات When I was resident, when I was in the gym, I was told that it was 30%. And you were talking about 40% decrease in cerebral blood flow. Already, the brain is traumatized, and you have a visual constriction, and you have a problem. And you have another 40% decrease, and you have a decrease. 
This is recipe for the patient to uh, to to get a berserk or banana, but it's a person. So uh, for each one millimeter, if you end up four percent decrease. So this is dangerous. As it might be drop as well as much as fifty percent following TBI, tra traumatic brain injury. So if there is traumatic brain injury already. You've got fifty percent decrease in cere cerebral blood flow. With the intermittent lafertility, if you end another forty percent, patient left with only ten percent cerebral blood flow. For carbon dioxide tension, internal carbon dioxide is extremely important in any operation, but especially at extreme of ages. Because you might end up with, and because of that, if you get out of the way, totally different persons, and they don't know where they are, and they don't know where they are. Hyperventilation, of course, we're hyperventilating. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I hate killing it. I think carbon, no less than 38 for me. Hyperventilation is high controversial. It's still in many books, but Cochrane database, I probably they recommend no less than 30 millimeter mercury. Whatever you do, if you have a case, with each millimeter mercury drop, the chances of ischemia are going to be paradoxically. Okay. In impeding, is it? It has to be hyperventilation. It has to be CO2 in the base construction. It has to be hyperventilation. It's not. بعرفش بعرفش حكي سؤال بس نو هايبر فنتليشن إن شاء الله إيش ما كان يكون لا ما كنت لك ما في فيش هايبر فنتليشن هلا at the time of لما يوصل الدكتور إحنا hopefully إنه المريض زي ما حكيت لك normal volumic normal tensor normal مش عارف إيش وهذا ودخل بدي يوصل لل 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 aneurysm you have to decrease blood pressure شوية على أساس أول إشي يقدر يوصل للهذا pressure usually inside aneurysm because at arterial levels it's usually uh, induce hypertension during the time of dissection and clipping. And it has been found that aneurysm and its vascular tree are more mobile at mean arterial of 50 millimeter mercury. It is a lot more difficult to get rid of it. And it is like the aneurysm that is like the clipping at this at around of 50 millimeter mercury. It is important that means it is measured at the level of the brain. This is what we talked about this time. This is what we talked about. خاصة إذا بعتم من الترانديوسر لأنه with each زي ما تعرف كل سنتي بنزل بنزل عندك الريدنج فما يكونش 20 سنتيمتر below the patient brain level بكون كل الريدنج اللي عندك بكون فولس so you have to check with the transducer to be exactly the same level where is the surgeons going going مشان يقدرون تحصل على ذي سفن the usual thing is to do is to reduce mean arterial pressure to 60 millimeter with the surgeon approaching the aneurysm and go to 50 millimeter with clipping زي ما حكيت بصير كتير أريح إله ومبين and he will have a very good view. A usual choice for him is between nitroglycerin, sodium hydroxide, beta blockade. وأعتقد هذا شو اللي بيدك منيح بليز استعمله. I'm not going to suggest anything. What is best in your hand? Please do use it. They tried use hypothermia. Survival of the show has been shown to be prolonged, profound hypothermia. اللي had active cooling, 20 degrees centigrade. It felt that they might be in this type of surgery. Unfortunately, it has been proven uh, very rarely used these days. There is no benefit or improvement mortality or even mortality. Reason there is no benefit. In, in. Clips, there is a golden or temporary clip, but then permanent clip. Communication is golden thing between you and the neurosurgeon all the time. In this case, Particularly all the time in any communication, but specifically in this case, communication and communication. We should know who is doing it, who is doing it. And there is a manipulation before usually they bleed. But then we have to record the clip time on and off. We should see if there is a safety issue. Maintain cerebral perfusion pressure at the clipping, and then start closing. And hopefully everything is fine. Now he put the clip like that. And once the clip is in, and there is a clip, blood pressure is raised. The pre-operative level. So, better than the other patients with chronic hypertension or injury. Well, care and the right on the right, but on the right, on the side to be done. This should be done slowly over 10 to 20 minutes. But if it's too much narcotics, so that it gets to the pre-operative level that it was on the side. Fluid prior to end of surgery, unless it was marked cerebral edema pre-operatively. Maintenance of adequate filling pressure, blood pressure will help prevent vessel spans becoming clinically significant. Rupture. 
what, what, what happens with them? If an intraoperative rashad does occur, and Sizul may be required to do any of the following. Lano is a bachelor, Zema Warja, but that slide. Lama Bachelor rupture, it's sheer nightmare. Zema happen. Mafia, let's take their Timsuko, while I tell you, you have to induce, you have to decrease blood pressure, you have to help him. Lano had a distance and artery, and Bafi and the fount in Nafora Shahal all the time. Sometimes, which is novel, more recent, adenosine arrest is fantastic in this situation, especially in bleeding. Or place manual pressure on the epsilateral carotid, you might decrease, although high ilha, mashakil ha, we prefer adenosine arrest. If significant dependent anticipated hypothermic arrest may be planned, arterial venous access will go on the pump. Khasta is a shuft aziz alayk wa shabu hada, why not? Wahal ayyam kullum mustashfayat fiha. إذا إنه كان البليدنج تورنش بليدنج ما أقدر وما راح يقدر أدرويز البرين كل البلاد راح يطلع من البرين وما راح يوصلوا هذا أسف فور البرين وهاي بتكون عندك نكس دور البام حطلوا بطلوا حد من الرزن تبعوا الكلب وحاولوا على البام وبصيروا and has been used which is successful by the way ميديان دوز طبعا الأدونيزين الرأس ال thirty milligram بعطيك thirty seconds of heart rate less than thirty beats per minute which is fantastic. Who will have 30 seconds? Wahad Zay, Mr. Gonzalez. I think those, those are the Hada added to him. But you will have 30 seconds arrest with 30 milligrams of adenosine, which is fantastic. Toward the end, CO2 normal, and I'm not normal right from the beginning, I don't believe in any decrease. Dura closed area, lots of intracranial spaces, normalize the blood pressure. A recovery patient should be assessed and recovery ward returned to intensive care بعد ما شافوا fully neurological problem. هلا بس في عنا few worries. Vasospasm. It it is almost nightmare and it happens in all rupture aneurysms. Rebleed is another problem. Infarction either due to clip clouding or vessel to thrombosis. And higher risk group, there may be continued decreased level of consciousness and usual complication occur, pulmonary edema. Postoperative fluid status, just to keep good urine output. No more, no less. Close eye and electrolyte status, no hyponatremia. It might occur and usually does occur. Potential complication, delayed working from anesthesia. We've used lots of drugs. لأنه في عندك phases hypertension hypertension normal cardio هذا فا you it takes longer time than usual craniotomies cerebral ischemia retraction temporary clefts and vas spasms brain swelling re bleeding incidence of oxygen eight percent and this highs at the يعني حتى ال surgical هذا بدك to be in your toes three days later all the three days هاي بدك تضلك يتوقع إنه ألو صارين غير تقدر تجينا بسرعة وهذا بدنا مش عارف إيش because Three days and the highest within 72 hours. Associated with morbidity and mortality. If there is a real bleeding, and I'm telling you, you have to make another consent with you. Because if there is a real bleeding, the mortality will go exponentially. With you, with you, with you. Yeah, let's go. 23% of these patients will have neurogenic pulmonary edema. We have seen them pulmonary edema. So be aware of the fluid and respiratory complication. Second most common cause of death will be respiratory. بعد بعد النيورولوجيكال. potential complication cardiac dysfunction usually are related to the severity of neurological injury زي ما سا great إذا كان for it's a must you will have some cardiac due to catecholamine surge leading to subendocardial necrosis. ECG abnormalities راح يكون عندك ST segment changes T wave وبعدين any Q wave always indicates significant myocardial injury. Any new wave, it means in the Marie Sarah and the myocardial injury. Always, always. Is a Sarah and the day three, day four, key waves, the Marie Sarah. So you have to consult your cardiologist because it's Sarah and the Marie Sarah. Hyponatremia syndrome, of course, as I said, it's going to happen a lot. Just a few words about the vasospasm. And as you can see, the leak, blood on the artery, and the artery is one-third of its distance. It is one of the worst problems in the condition causing ischemia, subsequent cerebral edema, further comprises the cerebral circulation. 
بس بدي احكي كلمتين مع نور بحكي لي تايم طولنا عليكم مش حطول ريدي مش كان الايفيدنس في لارج فاسل كونستراكشن از اولموست 80% اولموست اول اوف ذيم بالرابشر في عندهم فازو سباس كلينيكلي هيمو دايناميك سيجنيفيكانس 33% ستارتس ان دي 3 ذات واي تذكروا قلت لكم التايمنج مهم لانه اذا كان عنده السبركنويد اليوم الصبح وهلا انت جاي بعد الظهر الفازو سباس از نوت ذير ذيس از جولدن جولدن بيريود فور يو بيك 7 تو 8 دايز اند دي 21 ديو تو بلاد بريك داون ليش بيحصل؟ بس انا بدي احكي على على انا اي ثينك وي شود تيرم طبعا بيحصل بيكوز اوف اوكسجين بيحصل بيكوز اوف اوكسجين فري راديكلز اللي بيجوا حطيت لكم هاي التفاحه بتتذكروا اذا بتكسموها بتحطوها بتتعرض للاوكسجين تو بيكوت اوكسيدايز وتبلي روند ان نو تايم اذا بضل نسكن عليها بتضلها موجوده سيم ويز اوكسجين اوكسجين راديكلز اتس كاتاستروفي وانا اي ثينك انه وي شود لازم يكون عندنا نيو تيرز بالميدسن زي ما عندنا فايل ليك وكايل ليك وي شود هاف سم اوكسجين ليك والاوكسجين وانا عملنا محاضره ان شاء الله برجع لها بعدين بال... طلع بالجارديان بس سوري لاست ويك على الاوكسجين وحكينا لهم عملنا محاضره انه اوكسجين كود كل انه يو دونت نيد 800% 80% بالجارديان الاسبوع الماضي طلع أنيس تسي patients at risk after flawed oxygen guidelines اللي هو 100% هاي الأسبوع الماضي اللي طلعت بال بال جابيز فالأكسجين والأكسجين راديكالز هلا كمان لان كونتيوجن وحكينا عليهم بالتروم لان كونتيوجن probably if you do wash out قبل الثلاث أيام من الأكسجين راديكالز you do you do well for the patient you say will hypoxia will in the lungs المانجمنت هايبرفوليميا هيموداليوشن هايبرتنشن CVP 10 ملم mercury CVP زي ما حكينا above 60 blood pressure systolic above between 100 to 160 to 200 uh, and uh, hemodilution hematocrit 33% اللي بدهم يكونوا uh, so to conclude خلصت ابراهيم طولنا انسيزولوجيست كيرنج فور كرينتو انيوريزم should follow four main principles number one acute increase in anism transmuse cranes should be avoided at all times حتى لو انه ربشر لانه if it's ربشر you make it worse. Second, CPP should be maintained. Third, surgical exposure should be optimized by providing brain relaxation. Early emergence is favored لانه مشان بدك تشوفه وتطلع على هذا. And patient with surgery with, with cerebral aneurysm present unique challenge for anesthesia. So, well, trust me, زي ما حكيت والله every time is first time. No matter how many patients you anesthetize, every time is first time. Every time is an exam for you. You're going to succeed with this. He's going to put the clip, patient's going to go to work or not, every time is first time. And the surgeon should have thorough understanding of pathophysiology, communication with neurosurgery is paramount. And is paramount. Timing and the hospital to enter the name and enter the food will clip. It's complete, it's totally. And there will always be patients who, despite our best efforts, fail to benefit from surgical procedure. However, proper planning optimal result can be hoped for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, do you use anything to reverse the uh, adenosine effect? Or no, is it just, uh, just a one-time shot? One-time shot. The adenosine half-life anyway is around 20 seconds. Okay. 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 So, 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 لا لانه فورنا لانه زي ما انت عارف every time extubation re-extubation will increase mortality with 25% بس بتبدا انا سالت مروان about ruptured and unruptured aneurysm we said that if you have 100 patients and they have subarachnoid hemorrhage due to ruptured aneurysm 50 will die on the spot and the 50 the other 50 will reach to the hospital why did they reach to the hospital because there is a clot at the fundus of the aneurysm <coughs> It blocks it. Those who continue to bleed, they would reach nowhere, they would die. But those who would develop a clot and defend us, they would reach the hospital. Now your duty is to neutralize that aneurysm before it ruptures again. And CSF around the aneurysm has this ability to dissolve blood clot. So you need to operate quickly. Immediately. Immediately. The more you operate, the quicker, the better. And uh, if you take the patient to theater, his aneurysm may rupture any time. 
on induction of anesthesia, during opening the flap, during manipulation, etc. So you have to be prepared. You have to be prepared for the rupture aneurysm. Not only to clip the aneurysm, but what to do if it ruptures. And one major principle of this is what we call proximal uh, control. So, middle cerebral aneurysm coming from internal carotid. So I prepare the internal carotid so that if it ruptures, I can put temporary clip on it. I'm going to show another rupture of aneurysm because this is the most frightening experience in your life to face a ruptured aneurysm. You would wish you were never born. You would wish that you had never existed because you know you can do nothing. You cannot put an artery forceps. You cannot put anything. So you have to control yourself <coughs> before you control the bleeding. So this is no. no. Uh, in case of middle cerebral aneurysm, we have to open the sylvian fissure, and this is for the neurosurgical residents and even neurosurgeons. You <coughs> open the sylvian fissure always on the frontal side of the sylvian fissure, not on the temporal. Uh, the, the circulation there is less than in the temporal. And as you see here, you can reach to the aneurysm. So again, the sylvian fissure comes sometimes as straight, sometimes it's wide, sometimes it's curving. You have to be prepared for all these eventualities. So let's see the surgery. It's going to be quick, I'm not going to take time. Remember this patient came about two weeks after the rupture of aneurysm. Look at the brain, how angry it is. Very so angry. It was with the, what we said, vasospasm would be at maximum. Absolutely, very angry. I cannot find the space to go in. But patiently, you would drain CSF, etc., etc., and then you start seeing the optic nerve, and then you see the carotid. You try to make sure that the carotid is there, available for you to put temporary clip on it if necessary. Now, have a, the carotid is ready for me, there, optic nerve, carotid. Now I'm opening the sylvian fissure. This is the way to open it. And as I'm opening, it will rupture. That's the aneurysm. You have to be prepared for this minute every time you deal with an aneurysm. It will rupture at a time you're not expecting it, at a time when you are looking around, at a time when blood pressure is up and so on. So I have to open the arachnoid here, and as I do so, it will rupture. Nothing more frightening than this moment, but again, nothing more satisfying than clipping of an aneurysm. See, minor bleed. You say, okay, I'll continue. It does not stop. I want you to live these moments of fear that I have lived in that case. Bleed, it seems to be okay. Okay, let me cauterize that. Maybe he can make a clot on the, on the fundus of the aneurysm. You put the Bipolar, it opens more. Squirting. Absolutely. It's. And now at this time, this is the dialogue between you and the minister. Please take the blood pressure down as much as you can, as safely as you can. Hyperventilation or not, it does not make any difference because we are not dealing with brain edema. It is edematous, but I drain CSF. My concern is this to lower the blood pressure so the bleeding is less so that I can see and then I can continue the dissection. Now that this is a very bad moment. It ruptures before I'm sure of what are the relationship of this aneurysm. I want to know what is the fundus, what is the branches, the temporal branches and the frontal branches of the middle cerebral, where are they before I put my clip? And I tell you, there is nothing that you can do about it. So yesterday, I worked on putting these moments for you, so that you see the, the horror movie that the clipping of under is missed. And uh, sadly, that we are not producing any resident of any sort who knows anything about vascular anatomy or pathology or circulation or anything. We produce residents who can do shunt and disc. And this is not a neurosurgery. So an era, a group 
of neurosurgeons are coming out without any knowledge of this. Look at this clot, a very hard clot because it's two weeks. And I have to remove the hard clot of the fundus of the aneurysm. This is a clot on the fundus of the aneurysm. This is middle cerebral coming to me. This is the aneurysm here, but there is a clot on top. I want to see the branches around it. So I'm trying to dissect. And as you dissect, it will rupture again. Here you say, I wish I'm dead. I wish I don't exist. Why did I go into medicine? Why neurosurgery? Why me? You have all these questions in your mind. So that's the aneurysm, that's the fundus. But I want to put a clip here. I want to see the relationship. Again, I have the carotid ready for me to clip, but if I can manage without, that's better, because if I put here, then I have to finish quickly. Maximum four minutes. Put a clip on the carotid, come back to the aneurysm, dissect it, and clip it. If you can do it without, it's better. So if I put a clip, I say to the anesthetist, temporary clip is on carotid. So I start counting how many minutes. If I exceed the four minutes, it'll say, take your clip out. I take it out, it will bleed, and then I'll put it again until I finish my job. Aneurysm surgery is the top class of neurosurgery, and it is really hard. So I'm cutting the clot because it does not want to move. I really do so, but this clot was so hard that it didn't move. It's a clot, just very organized clot. Here you are, ruptured again. Here also you need a good assistant. So how much who, blood did you end up giving him? Uh, it's not major blood loss, it is the, the blood obscuring your, uh, your vision. You may bleed from your radial artery more than this one, but radial artery you can see, this you couldn't see. Radial artery, you can put an artery clip on it, here you can't. It's, it's, it's a fundus, the whole fundus has ruptured. I've learned the trick from my boss that if there is a bleeding like this, you put the sucker on the fundus and let the suction pull the fundus and then you can put your clip. And that's what I did. I use this trick which I learned, and here's my clip coming, I put it, the bleeding stop. But I'm not happy about it, I'm not happy that I really close the neck of the aneurysm. If I did not close it, this is incomplete clipping, like incomplete coiling, it will rupture again. So I bring another coil, another clip, and I adjust it. There's no escape. You don't say, oh, okay, I've secured the aneurysm. You didn't. You have to close the neck properly without closing the parent artery. Now I'm happy. Now, what Dr. Mario said, this, uh, so I take the first clip and I keep the, the good one. In one of my cases that I, I did as a resident, it was a middle cerebral aneurysm. I put the clip on it, you could see the retractor here, retractor here, I put the clip, removed the retractors, closed the dura, closed the bone, and as we walked out from the theater to the ICU, uh, I've noticed the patient is hemiplegic. So I called my boss, I said, sir, I've clipped the aneurysm, but the patient is hemiplegic. He said, let me see the video film. So I went to the video room. Put the, it was a big VHS thing, and we looked at the clipping, see, very nice, beautiful clipping. And then I, when we removed the retractor, it was apparent that when you remove the retractors, the brain moved, the clip did it. So it's not slip, but actually it angled the middle cerebral and blocked it. So I said, take him back and adjust your clip. Took him back immediately, opened his skull again, adjust the clip, he came out normal. Anyway, that's first up. That's how the scale was well, and he improved it dramatically. He was discharged. 
And this is the skull x-ray, maybe I put the lens off for you to see the clip. You can see there and there. This is the CT scan. Usually there's an artifact because of the metallic nature of the clip. And this is what you see, is the so-called previous stroke that he had, which was a previous subarachnoid hemorrhage not noticed by anybody. This is him, back to his office. <coughs> I followed him up, 2002. I called him, he's back from Saudi Arabia. And I met with him, I did a brain MRI on him. And he was so well. So, thank you very much. So, it's open for any discussion, any questions, any comment. Please. So, Mahmoud Nisa is a neurosurgeon qualified to sit for the exam. So, uh, why after leaving, you uh, did not get approximate control? Because I thought I can manage. It was not a, putting a temporary clip on the artery means that you have got into this four minutes window. Mm -hmm. I prefer to stay, keep that option to the last. If I still manage, I, I better not to put the clip. And as I said sometimes, four minutes is not enough. So the anesthetist will tell you, four minutes are off, finished. So I remove the clip, it will bleed, but some of blood will reach to the brain. And then I put the clip again and start all over again. Any questions, comments? If not, thank you, and we'll see you next Wednesday.